Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to our webcast, Three Hottest Trends in Flash Storage. And uh, my name is Frank Berry. I'm the founder and I'm the senior analyst with IT Brand Pulse, and I'll be moderating this interactive panel discussion. Uh, the other panelists in the webcast are Jeff Baxter, senior director with NetApp, and John Woodall, VP of Engineering with Integrated Archive Systems, which is a solutions provider and partner with NetApp. Uh, the third panelist is you. So um, if, if you choose to participate, um, all you have to do is raise your hand. The, the, here's the panel format is we're going to cover um, each of the hot trends in sequence. Uh, we'll pick a panelist to talk about the hot trend, address some of the questions I ask. And, uh, and then we're going to pick uh, IT pros who raise their hand. Um, we're going to, we'll, we'll uh, Please submit your question in the Q&A, and, and, and whoever submits the best question will pick you, and if you're picked, then uh, we'll, we'll uh, put you down and send you a $20 Amazon card. There's no limit on the number of questions that you can ask. We'll, we'll send you an Amazon $20 Amazon card for each question that you ask. Okay, so with that, let's get started. Uh, so the three hottest flash storage trends in 2019 are persistent memory, NVMe over fabrics, and flash storage in hybrid clouds. So trend number one, persistent memory. So what this chart shows is that in very general speaking, persistent memory sits somewhere in between um, NV, or RAM, DRAM, and secondary storage. So Jeff, uh, let, let me ask you three questions. One, why does NetApp call it persistent memory instead of storage class memory? Two, why is byte addressable important? And three, why is this such a hot trend? Thanks, and thanks for uh, having us on this morning. Looking forward to a great webcast here. So I think the first question, and you'll have to refresh my memory by the time we get to number three, but the first question was really, why do we call it persistent memory? And I think, um, as you can see by the slide, we, we really do use both terms, right? So we use persistent memory, I like to think we're, you know, doing aliases here, right? So AKA storage class memory. Um, both can actually refer to the similar sorts of media, but I think it's really in terms of um, some key distinctions about them and, and primarily around the use case, right? We talk about persistent memory when we're looking at it really um, as serving as an adjacency or an expansion of what you would typically use DRAM for, right? So think of something that's near the storage of traditional sort of DRAM, uh, near the performance, right? but more capacity and, and kind of at that middle ground between memory and today's flash media, right? So we talk about persistent memory when we're really trying to emphasize this is memory, um, but you know, it survives across power loss, so you can use it um, also as a storage layer. When we talk about using it within storage, that's where we really start to shift to using the term storage class memory. Uh, now, uh, the part with it being byte addressable, I think that's tied into persistent memory. It's uh, one of the magic of this type of media is that you can treat it as storage, right? Or you can actually treat it and, uh, as memory, right? Use memory semantics um, and get to it either as a, I don't know if I'd call it a replacement for DRAM, right? But an expansion or um, more enhancement of, of DRAM capabilities. Um, or you can use it as storage. Now, to be frank, um, no, that's you actually. But to be frank, um, you know, it's gonna be really expensive storage on a dollar per terabyte to start just as Today's NAND flash was really expensive on a dollar per terabyte to start, and that will change over time. But the capabilities it brings are, are uh, you know, can't be matched by any other sort of mix. So I think you'll see it being used as both terms. I'm sorry, what was the third question in that list there? So the third question is, why is it such a hot trend? Real simple terms. Yeah, so, and, and that is kind of tied to what I said, right? There's no other way of getting at that really interesting intersection point where you're getting down into the, single digit you know, latency of microseconds, and we'll go, we'll go into more depth on that later on. Um, but getting to that point, because people aren't, you know, in the past people have built out giant, you know, pretty benchmarks on huge amounts of RAM, right? But it's economically prohibitive to do that, and that's not gonna change anytime soon. Um, and at the same time, we're doing amazing things with NVMe, and other things we'll talk about later in this webcast with making access to NAND flash incredibly fast, but it's also going to hit that sort of point where take that next order of magnitude speed jump. So this persistent memory occupies that really interesting sweet spot for this next generation of emerging apps that want that you know, single microsecond sort of access 
um, but at a price point that while still reasonably high, is not like going out and building a giant box of RAM, right? It's, it's really that sweet spot that you see here in the middle. Okay, so the answer is, it's, it's, uh, it has a terabyte, it's got a lot of capacity for a lot less than DRAM, but, and it's, it's a whole lot, it's, and it's a new class, it's a whole lot faster than secondary storage, and we're gonna cover that more in the, in, in the, in the future. Sure. So I, I and I'm gonna I'm, I'm we're seeing some questions pop up so so uh, we, we're gonna get to those Shiva I see your question so so we'll, we're gonna get back to you on that in a second um, okay so next slide so it, the the question is 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 uh, persistent memory PMEM storage class memory is it for servers or is it for storage systems so Jeff is PMEM for storage or servers and where is NetApp using PMEM? So is persistent memory for servers or storage systems? And the answer to that is yes. Um, it's, it's really shouldn't be an or, right? It's, it's really an and, right? So these are, these are uh, you know, peanut butter and chocolate, I guess, right? Better together. Um, where we see it is really how do you intend to use it, right? Are you intending to use it, you know, within a single host where you want to really accelerate that emerging application on it? And, you know, obviously sitting inside a server by definition is going to give you the shortest path between the application and the persistent memory. I mean, there's no getting around the laws of physics, right? So having it sitting directly on the bus is going to give you uh, the, the quickest access to it. Um, in a lot of ways, it's going to be the simplest access if it's just a standalone system. But if it's not a standalone system, if you're having to coordinate it with backend storage, you start to get into complexities about how do I use it? How do I protect it, right? If it is persistent, especially how do I protect it? And how do I use it without changing my application? And we'll get into sort of NetApp's plans and how we think about doing that. But if you're starting to get into all those questions and you're really thinking, you know, I want to accelerate my entire environment or I want to accelerate across multiple different workloads, then it looks much more like a classical shared storage argument where you would want to use that storage class memory in your storage system. Now, today we don't use sort of for mainstream use, we don't use any persistent memory um, inside our all flash systems, but we have stated and we've stated publicly that our vision is certainly to include that and you know to be fair I think that's an industry vision. I think we've been leading on it, right? But it, it just makes sense just as NetApp pioneered the concept of using flash as a cache um, Almost a decade ago now um, putting with our flat, uh, flash cache technology and later our flash pool technology where we put flash in front of hard drives the same sort of concept that we've demonstrated on stage and we've dem put demos out there and, and sort of proof of concept of using storage class memory to accelerate flash. Uh, it's the exact same concept and it'll have the exact same sort of benefits of selectively accelerating uh, either parts of workloads or entire workloads, but automatically without a lot of administrator intervention. So the answer is going to be both, right? You're going to use it in servers for um, selective and, and increasing acceleration of these emerging applications. And then you're going to see it over time in storage systems um, where it's used just as flash in hybrid systems accelerates disk. It's going to be used to accelerate flash. Okay, thank you. Okay, this next chart shows some cost data that IT Pram Pulse has compiled. And I'd like to say that what we found is the cost varies wildly, so mileage may vary. But the intention of this chart is just to give you an example of the scale of the benefits, the magnitude of the benefits, and also what types of benefits are there. And really, there's two types of benefits. It allows you to save money versus DRAM. Um, so, if, so if you can live with the performance of PMEM, and you'll save some money versus DRAM. And it allows you to improve the performance versus um, SSDs with, with, for, with PMEM. So what I'd like to do now is shift over to John. So John works, works with a solution provider. So he's uh, where the, where the uh, rubber hits the road, working with customers every day. So I'd like to ask him some, some you know, customer-facing problems or questions. So John, you work with customers every day. Which benefit will drive most customer interest, savings or performance? And, uh, and then why do people call it persistent memory instead of storage class memory? Uh, second one's easy. I think we've kind of answered that and I'll come to that. But I think what I see in my customers is, you know, if you have an application, you know, I think, you know, Jeff, we, we talked earlier, you know, NetApp's vision about putting um, storage class memory products at different places um, where it makes sense 
part of that's an economic play to a little bit of PMM goes a long way, just like Flash Cash and Fab, you know, Fabric Pools did the same thing. Not Fabric Pools. <laughs> Which fabric flash pools? Flash, flash pools. I get fabric. <laughs> there'll be a quiz later. Yeah, there'll be a quiz later. Um, I think the the real issue is, you know, for certain applications, I think performance drives the discussion. So that's going to be, um, you know, databases typically, whether it's Oracle, SQL Server, Mongo, things of that nature. Um, you know, Monte Carlo simulations, real time fraud detection. That's where host side, you know, NVDIM today, store, um, Optane, three cross point coming will drive that discussion because there's a business imperative that that performance addresses. I think there'll be more of an economic benefit as uh, persistent memory shows up in different places in, if you will, the fabric, and allows you to perhaps play with tiering different levels of media uh, as an option that's been alluded to and, and demonstrated in the past with NetApp where um, you, you can balance that. And I think ultimately it comes down to customer choice and flexibility where you have absolute raw performance requirements, you know, that's going to drive the discussion when your workload may not be at the extreme end, but you still would want more consistent, better performance, but somehow mitigate or manage costs better. Um, there's a place where that will fit too. Um, now to the second question, you know, persistent versus storage class memory. I think they're interchangeable terms. Um, it's an industry trend, whether today it's NVDIM, Tomorrow it'll be, you know, Optane, Crosspoint, and there'll be something I'm sure that follows after that, that this this whole discussion will 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 revolve around. Okay, great answers. Okay, so we, we in our previous slides we've showed two different pictures of of PMEM, and that's because one of them is an MD DIM form factor, and the other one is the Intel Optane DIM form factor. So, John. Please explain the difference between these two and, and how NetApp is using the two different types. <laughs> well, okay, so some of this I can I can say and some of it I can't. I think today we're seeing, and it's it, again, NetApp has demonstrated a leadership position around storage class memory product adoption, the implementation of NVMe as a protocol, NVMe over fabric. Um, and right now I think from the NVDIM perspective, that's the form factor that is more commonly available, typically on the server vendor side. So your server platform of choice, whoever it may be from, will have either today or will shortly introduce NVD support. I expect the same exact trend around Intel Optane or 3D Crosspoint that there will be a generation of servers that come out that have specific slot support um, for that. And then the other part of that is the operating system side, right? So is, is there a support on the OS side? Um, and then we get into the NetApp Max data product on the host side. Um, from the, you know, where's NetApp putting this today? You know, that's something that that's probably more of an NDA discussion about directions. I think Jeff's done a great job of saying we're going to have it in multiple places. When and where specifically is something that, that, that we can't talk about here, but I fully expect, um, You'll see it, and you're going to see it across the industry. I mean, NetApp's in a leadership position, but this is like going from, you know, SCSI to SAS. It's, a, it's an evolutionary step. It's the next generation of what you should expect from every single vendor in the space. Um, and, you know, it'll, it'll just repeat itself again. Okay. So at this point, we're, there's a, a, a question from one of our attendees about, the applicability and the cost effectiveness. Um, for, so David Brafer is asking this question. David, if you want to, if you want to ask your question live, we're opening up your mic right now. Do you want to go ahead and ask? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so my question is, how uh, economically efficient, uh, feasible, and also performance feasible is for large scale HPC systems. So. You're looking at say you know one of the top ten, top twenty on the uh, of the biggest machines in the world, and they have tens of thousands of nodes. Is it something which you'll see in the next couple of years or five years' time, where people start to take advantage of the extra memory? So, David, thanks for thanks for your question. I was seeing that on the chat. I, I think. Um, so I'm going to skip the usual it depends answer, right? Because that that's almost as, as you know, as we all know in this industry, you know, workloads vary. But uh, I, I think I can tackle that a couple of different ways. One, 
um, thousands of nodes with persistent memory is going to be a significant amount of money, right? Yeah. Um, I, you know, that's, I don't think there's any other way of saying that. Now, as with all things media, you know, things that appear expensive today, five or 10 years from now are pedestrian, right? So um, I, I think it's realistically in the next couple of years, probably not in five years, maybe. The other key thing to look at really is, you know, how does it improve the TCO? What's the benefit, right? If you're putting it across thousands of nodes, I would hope that the benefit would be that you wouldn't need thousands of nodes, right? That the payback would be each of those nodes having such lower efficiency, not sitting in an IO wait state, um, keeping the CPUs or increasing the GPUs um, constantly busy is where you're going to get the ROI in addition to completing jobs faster, right? So it's a little bit harder to, to do the ROI, but if these HPC um, setups typically are doing large scale simulations, um, you know, from the public sector side, doing nuclear safety simulations, stuff like that, if they can do X times more simulations in a year, what's the, the payback on that? Um, the other thing I would say is, and, and John, I don't know if you agree with this or not, but the persistent memory, I mean, that the latency um, benefits are really going to apply to those massive sort of random I.O. situations, read different things like that. A lot of HPC is all about sequential performance. And, you know, heck, I think we still see some HPC environments using just large scale streaming hard drives, right, um, using flash. So it really depends on the sort of workloads on there. If persistent memory is going to offer a little benefit or a lot of benefit. Yeah, I just, John, I would only add just, I, I agree completely with that. I think it, the economic discussion will come down to, is there a measurable business benefit, whatever the workload is, whether it's reducing the footprint physically, you know, if you're doing AI workloads, you typically do GPUs over CPUs at some point because it's cheaper, but there's an upfront cost to do that. Is there a benefit to your business in this case or the application by getting more work done in the same amount of time or getting more work done faster? You know, same, same way to say the same thing. So if you can measure that, then the economics take care of themselves. But over time, as Jeff said, the cost of media will typically come down and it'll become more uh, mainstream or pedestrian, as Jeff said. So I think we're on the same page with that. We'll see it start to enter in where it makes the most sense, and then it'll kind of proliferate across the industry as pricing changes. Okay. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. I know, Frank, uh, Shiva on, on the chat had asked a very similar question. So I think John's answer about quantifying the cost benefit for, for persistent memory to your CIO, it, it's exactly that, right? I don't think persistent memory changes the ROI or TCO calculation. It's just a different media that you would insert into that calculation to justify to your CIO and, and your CFO. Yeah. So now what I would expect is for database workloads, it may have, may have again, your mileage will vary, a direct impact on um, core-based licensing could, could come down significantly. That, that's something to, to look at. Okay, we have one other. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep moving here. We have another a, a person that's raised their hand. Annie, Annie, if you would like to ask your question, we open up the mic for you. Annie, wait. did you have a question? Maybe an accidental hand raise. Okay, we're going to keep moving. Okay, so in our in this slide, what we're showing is the typical types of app, very demanding applications that are used as examples of where you're going to find the use of of PMEM. And my question for John is, you know, is is this really the the uh, only place where PMEM is going to be used, or I think we touched on maybe it'll be a little bit more pervasive use than just with these applications. Can you comment on that, John? I think it goes into the talk track and, and the stream of the conversation that we've had so far where there are going to be leading use cases based on the benefit. And so these four buckets that I see represented here, whether it's Real-time analytics, fraud detection, et cetera, absolutely makes sense. And the financial services industry is usually on the very cutting edge of that because of the, the requirements they have. In-memory databases, this is not going to replace SAP HANA or Oracle 12C in-memory because that's an in-memory product that requires nanosecond response times. But it's the reload time from persistent storage that matters. And so uh, if your SLA with your business is to reload SAP HANA you know, as quickly as possible, you may find PMEM in that highest level tier. 
uh, AI, machine learning, deep learning, neural networks, absolutely you will see this technology go there because there's demonstrable benefit in that context around either uh, training faster or improving the accuracy of your learning um, and the percentage of predictability. So you're going to see that. And then data warehousing, again, anything real time, you know, see rack reference. So I think these are absolutely the right initial buckets. More as pricing comes down, as people get more comfortable building these architectures, you'll see it proliferate. So what I was, so John, tell me if this is correct. But I think what I was hearing perhaps is that, you know, if you're going to have a terabyte of PMEM that, or, or, you know, hundreds of gigs of PMEM that would fit into some of these applications, but perhaps there's going to be a little bit of it sprinkled in every storage and server. Yes. Uh, again, the architecture and, and what you build will vary. There's going to be multiple ways to do that. And that's what a good architect will figure out is, you know, that that's where we would help a customer, if you will, how much is the right amount where, you know, if you need something that's a lot in a single location, we're maybe looking at shared storage at some time down the road. If we're looking at how can we help you on the specific host side and accelerate, you know, that would be from a NetApp perspective, max data. Yeah. Okay. It, it reminds me. It reminds me, John, of, um, you know, almost a decade ago or something like that, where you saw, you saw vendors coming out with NAND flash systems that were all flash, right? And they were a terabyte of flash, and they were hundreds of thousands of U.S. dollars, right? Yep. And for that very, very interesting tier zero point solution where you didn't need a whole bunch of features, right? Um, and there were, there's some vendors who've been acquired. There's some that have, you know, dearly departed, right, from that space, but it was a very specific sort of targeted stuff. And then you saw other people, including NetApp, and, and the rest of the industry followed suit using it to selectively accelerate, right? With flash, flash cache that we talked about, right? Yep. And so it's, it's the, uh, and by the way, then when people really want to accelerate with flash, they were putting it on the host with stuff like Fusion IO at the time, different things like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's gonna, I think that's going to repeat itself in a lot of ways, right? Someday we'll be looking back at this webcast and laughing because everything will be, you know, persistent yeah. memory, right? That's just the way the media goes. Um, but at least today, you know, what we've said with our vision and what we've released with, and I know we're, we're headed towards max data, is, okay, let's use it on the server where it makes sense, mm -hmm. right? Um, let's look at selectively sprinkling it over storage arrays, and we've demonstrated that as a proof of concept and, and our vision moving forward, and it's becoming, I think, a shorter and shorter term vision, right, um, towards getting there. And, you know, over time, will there be all storage class memory arrays? Sure, but, but just like the really early man flash arrays, they may have been before their time, mm -hmm. right? And there was that second generation that really had hit the economic sweet spot. Yep. Okay, so we've touched on, on uh, a little bit on the technology, a little bit about the benefits, the cost performance benefits. Now, Jeff, tell us a little bit about a product somebody can actually get their hands on to use it. Yeah, so um, Max Data is the name of this product that we brought to market um, here at NetApp. And it's really exciting for us because it's, it's a launch of a product into really a, a brand new category. Um, not that server-side storage software is new per se, but being able to use persistent memory, accelerate your enterprise applications, and we have some examples of that acceleration coming up, but without having to rewrite your applications, without having to redo your entire architecture, right? Use in place these key enterprise applications, put persistent memory in, but not lose out on all the enterprise value props. Um, so we announced this. This was the um, actually the acquisition several years ago of a company called Plexi Store, which is absolutely leading edge on this. We've taken that technology, um, taken some of the geniuses behind that technology who uh, you know work at NetApp now, and have really productized this, uh, made it enterprise grade, uh, and released it as a tool that can not only accelerate at the server but tie into an entire ecosystem on the back end. Uh, NetApp's OnTap uh, Nine operating system, which is the, basically the um, data management framework, uh, the number one storage operating system in the world, taking all of that sort of cloud connectivity, that enterprise ready state that you see at the bottom of this diagram in one of our uh, all flash AFF systems and tie it together, all those enterprise capability with max data running in the server. So you get really the best of both worlds. I, I mentioned you know, some of the challenges that come with persistent media about how do I protect the data? Um, how do I back it up? How do I tear data out of it when I get cold? Mm -hmm. Our answer is max data, right? Our answer is take all that benefit, run it in the server. Don't pretend that you that you don't want it in the server, right? That's the right place for it in a lot of cases. 
but don't give up all those enterprise grade features and tie it in mm -hmm. to an enterprise grade all flash and hybrid storage operating system with uh, with NetApp and, and OnTap. And I would just double down on that with respect to Max data and the integration to OnTap. Um, being able to have a persistent backend that ties into the NetApp data fabric story that allows you to create workflows with copies of that data is, is really a differentiated uh, position in the market. It ties into customer flexibility and freedom of choice. And I think those are important things because it's very easy in these high performance discussions to become very siloed about, hey, how fast is fast? And that's important. If you really need to go fast, there's an answer and, and Max Data is part of that. But if you actually look at how do I protect that data, how do I do test FQA, UAT testing, uh, if it's machine learning, whatever the use case is, you may need to have copies, you may need to be able to do other things with that data that just persistent memory and doing it on the host isolate you from. NetApp has a comprehensive architecture that allows you to, the customer, to put your data where it makes the most sense and to derive value of it at different points in its life cycle. And that's not a trivial point. That, that's an actually a very good differentiator in my mind. Yeah. We kind of internally talk about it as, you know, right price, right time, right place, right? Like orchestrating and automating that as much as possible for our customers and, and for their end users, so that you don't have to think about it, right? If the right place and the right time is in persistent memory on a host, Max Data will get the data for you. If it's, you know, cold as dirt, right, data, then you don't want it sitting there. You don't even want it sitting in an all-flash system. Let's tear it all the way down to an S3 bucket running on the cheapest storage you can get, whether that's on-prem or in the cloud. It's all part of that architecture. Yep. Speaking of use cases, can uh, t tell us about a few use cases. Sure. So, uh, you know, and, and these are um, just some, some starting examples. I, I would say it's almost the, uh, the starting uh, opening bet for, for Max Data, right? So you can see an example here where we're actually, you know, comparing against ourselves, right? Against the industry leading A800 um, platform, running fiber channel, NVMe storage behind it. We'll talk more about that, but, um, you know, just a beast of a system. But when you absolutely positively want to hit that latency and IOPS curve, and you'll see, you know, the, the, the one of the fastest, um, I think the fastest probably all flash system in the world on that yellow. And you almost need to start changing the scale when you get down into things like max data running on persistent memory. When you're talking, you know, that single digit uh, microsecond sort of latency, getting up into the hundreds of thousands of IOPS and just that smooth curve, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's all about the media and using it efficiently, right? Um, the 800 is probably the absolute most efficient way to use NAND flash, but where Max Data gets its advantage is it's using persistent memory and having that order of magnitude improvement on both. And you can clearly see the higher performance, the lower latency. And you know what that's going to deliver to you in terms of massively accelerating your Oracle database. And what's funny is the the yellow line that the A800, the latency there is outstanding. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just Max Data is that much better and faster on that. Yeah, if people didn't catch that, the top of that entire graph was zero point four, right? Yeah. So it's it's it's, it's we well, had to change the scale. Perspective. Yeah, that, that almost feels like a speed animation that zooms out to show hard drives, right? Like yeah. up in like lower earth orbit right something like that right is <laughs> exactly. about where they'd be on that chart so yeah okay and you know so this is another use case with with mongodb right just showing you know number of documents per query um you know across the bottom and you know as we start to scale up um and as we start to see we just put it up against um you know xfs and it's not a shot at xfs it could be just about any um standard traditional file system out there the, the proof point is, you know, being able to have this incredibly fast media and use Max Data to make it accessible to existing applications, right? We didn't have to do anything to MongoDB, just like in the last example, we didn't have to do anything to Oracle, right? Using native semantics, it's a file system you load on top of, of your server. It looks like a normal file system to your application, so you can use Oracle, you can use MongoDB, but you get these sort of order of magnitude, you know, 10, 10 11 times faster uh, performance without doing a single thing to change the application. Um, and that's going to be in comparison to any traditional file system out there um, because we're able to unlock the value of the persistent memory to do it. Okay, so thanks for, thanks for that. And, th and it's time to move on to our trend number two, which is NVMe over fabrics. Um, so Jeff, um, yeah. we, we, we know that there's been a lot of news covering NVMe over fabrics for the last year or so. So the industry's done a good job of promoting the specification, et cetera, but there's very little deployed. So my assumption is, is that 
there's not a real detailed understanding by the IT community. So can you give us a quick history on, on what's driving this and give us a little overview of the technology and then why is this so hot? Sure, that, that's a great question. Yeah, I think I, I should have I should have negotiated my comp plan better, maybe like $20 every time I said the word NVMe. I'd, I'd be retired wealthy by now, right, over the last couple of years of discussion around NVMe. Um, we're at an interesting transition point though, right? NVMe, um, I think the industry probably started talking about it two or three years ago in, in mass, right? It was obviously being talked about before that by uh, people creating the standard. Uh, I think if we start from there, NVMe is an open standard, right? There's an NVMe Express, uh, Non-Volatile Memory Express consortium um, that helped build it, of which NetApp is proud to be a leading member, uh, part of their uh, uh, board of directors, slightly different name, but basically the board of directors building it. I think it's important to note it is an open standard, right? So, uh, you know, I work at NetApp. I love to talk about what we're doing with NVMe, but it, we don't believe in closed standards. We don't believe in creating new storage standards that other people can't use because that's not the right thing for our customers and, and for the ecosystem in whole. So NVMe Express, industry standard, um, new protocol layer. And that's a very important thing. John and I were talking a little bit earlier to, to understand. One of the interesting things that happened with NVMe is because the earliest way that a lot of people could use NVMe was as a way to attach SSDs, right? And that's shown in the middle here. Um, people got the idea that an NVMe SSD was a thing, like it was something about the SSD itself. But in reality, NVMe is the protocol that you use to connect to it. Um, so NVMe, the reason that it's been so important is that it's going to help accelerate just about anything. I mean, it, it really is the first next generation replacement for SCSI. Um, you know, SCSI's been around, what, John, 30 years, 40 years? I don't even want to know. I don't want to know. Yeah, I remember buying my first SCSI hard drive. It was like the size of this table. It was 20 megs. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think it was 300, 400 bucks. I bought it at a warehouse, actually, right down the street from, from NetApp today. Um, and since then, you know, we've done serial attached SCSI, right? We've done near-lying serial attached SCSI, right? It's all been the same SCSI semantic. NVMe is really the first next generation way to take to replicate in some way those underlying sem um, semantics, but without the SCSI command set, with a new command set and a new protocol designed for media that wants to operate at microsecond latencies, right? Uh, we've pushed, pushed SCSI incredibly far. You, you know, we've pushed it to hundreds of thousands of IOPS, sub-millisecond latency, but when you start talking microseconds and you start talking these new media, um, that's where we start to run into issues. So you're gonna see more and more conversation about not only NVMe and storage arrays, which um, our industry-leading A800 all flash array uses the, uh, these NVMe SSDs, but also about using NVMe over a fabric, right? And we'll go into more depth about that in some of the later slides, but uh, NVMe can work if it's inside a system attaching to a drive, or NVMe can actually work over a network attaching a host to storage and over multiple different transports, right? Fiber channel, TCP, InfiniBand, um, something called Rocky, right? RDMA over converged Ethernet. It's designed to work over all those multiple transport layers. So NVMe, um, it's, it's a choice today, right? It's the choice of I want to get high performance and lower latency, um, but in the future, it's just going to be the protocol for any sort of performance standard. It's, it's going to be adopted um, just like, you know, today, if you want to watch a movie on physical media, you're buying Blu-ray or you're buying 4K or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's just going to slowly but surely replace that over time. Okay. Oh, 19 times. 19 times NVMe? That's 20 dollars. That's 20 bucks? Yeah. Excellent. That's, That's a good rate. I can take the rest of the day off. Yeah. Okay, so with this chart, it, it shows you the impact of of this new network storage. And there, there's it's two things what I see here is one, this performance relative to an internal uh, SSD, uh, uh, the SAS NAND SSD to the left, and then and then it's also its performance relative to an NVMe NAND SSD. So, John, I have a couple questions, um, and, and what what I'm seeing is that um, there's very little difference between the performance. It's, there's only the network latency has been just been chopped down to, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 100 microseconds. So now you have very little difference between internal storage, and it's actually even faster than internal SAS NAN SSD. So given that, John, why would your customers use SAS or NVMe SSDs inside their servers if they can if they can have networked SAN storage of some type. And then <laughs> going along with that, does it, are we gonna see a swing back to, to SAN with NVMe fabrics? 
Well, I mean, I don't think there's a, I'll start with the second one first. I mean, you know, fiber channel sand today has been kind of the lowest latency overhead from a protocol perspective that from, that is from shared storage. NVMe over fabric is something that coexists on a fabric. Um, I, I'll use Brocade because they publicly published a, a joint white paper with NetApp last year uh, showing a NetApp A300 running fiber channel with a, a workload, I think it was a swab test. Don't hold me to that. Uh, but then just changed to an upgraded version of ONTAP, nothing else changed, and enabling NVMe over Fabric. You saw, if I remember the numbers correctly, something like 60% uh, improvement in IOPS and half the latency. So just a more efficient, highly parallel protocol running on the same fabric. And NetApp, again, future-proofing investments for customers. If you have a current generation A300 or higher, and you're doing fiber channel stand with NetApp, just going to ONTAP 9.5 will enable this from a, a protocol perspective and from a, what the software bits need to be. And then you have to have a relatively recent, but not latest generation fiber channel fabric. So you're, you're gonna see that as, again, if the workloads served by NAND flash over some type of fabric or locally aren't meeting your performance requirements, you have a couple of different levers to turn. You can go NVMe over Fabric with NetApp on Fiber Channel today. Um, you know, more, more protocols over time you would expect because that's an industry trend. Um, and then for, you know, the benefit of, you know, again, NAND flash being NVMe attached, you do see an improvement, but the real potential for NVMe um, in front of media is when you have things like NVDIM, uh, 3D CrossPoint, Optane, and other storage class memory products because their performance levers are so extreme that you have to get as much of the protocol out of the way as possible, and NVMe does that. So today it's NAND, NAND uh, flash to NVMe attached, NAND flash to NVMe over fabric, and then you know other media over time. But again, the customer gets to choose what makes sense. There's very easy ways to do that with existing uh, NetApp fiber channel stand. Okay, thank you. All right, so, so you know, we, we've established that it's incredibly fast, hardly any network latency. So you have this incredible, you, you have the incredible capability to access a uh, network storage at, as if it was local storage. So J Jeff, now the next issue for IT is, does that mean I have to throw out the baby with the bathwater? You know, it, uh, is our NVMe storage fabrics add-ons or upgrades? If I, if I install an all flash way with my fabric interface, will my existing app servers be able to get to it? If I have, if I already have a fiber channel AFA, well, you know, how does that, how does that play into this picture? Yeah, so I, I, it's a great question. And I'll say, unfortunately, I, I do think as with any new technology, and I'll, I'll just be blunt, right? I think there's always going to be people in industry who try to use it as a reason to force a forklift upgrade, whether that's to a competitive solution or um, just, you know, hey, rebuy all the gear you already have and do it right now. Um, you know, NetApp, NetApp has never had that attitude, right? To the extent that possible, um, we want to provide those new capabilities in software, right? John mentioned ONTAP 9.5, um, just ways that people can upgrade their existing gear and use all these technologies. The only time when we ever want to require new hardware is when literally the existing hardware won't support a standard or won't support a protocol. It's a network card that doesn't support RDMA or, or something like that, right? Um, and, and then over time, as systems get older and older and fall out of support, right? You have that natural sort of non-destructive life cycle. But if a system can run a uh, given software, we want to go ahead and supply that. And we don't believe, and, and I think just like what happened with Flash, and it's happening again with NVMe, quite frankly, there's a whole bunch of new companies out there that are saying, you need to move to us because you know we're all NVMe. It's like congratulations, you and everyone else, right? Everyone's going to have NVMe. Everyone's going to have NVMe over fabric offerings. Um, we're industry leading, but certainly some of our uh, top tier competitors are going to have that capability as well, or at least they've either shifted or saying that they will. Um, so I don't think it has to be a forklift upgrade, and especially within a NetApp ONTAP environment, the ability to non-destructively upgrade your systems, the ability to use NVMe over fabric, keep the transport the same. All right, so go from fiber channel protocol running on a fiber channel transport, the NVMe protocol running over that same fiber channel transport. Mm -hmm. As John mentioned, our partnership with Brocade, in a lot of cases, you have a Brocade Gen 5 or, or their newer Gen 6 uh, 32 gig switches, and you can be running fiber channel side by side with NVMe and switch over literally 
system by system. And in a lot of cases, you're not going to, I know all of us as IT professionals just love screwing with something that's working, right? That's like our favorite thing to do in the world. You're not going to sit there and, and take a perfectly good application, a perfectly good server and switch it over. Why would you bother? But every new server that comes online, you add in as NVMe over fiber channel on the same exact switch. If you have a system that literally is pushing the fiber channel limits, maybe that one you switch over to NVMe over fabric, right? Piece by piece, you non-disruptively move your environment over to NVMe um, over fabrics, NVMe SSDs, but you do it over the course of a standard depreciation cycle, mm -hmm. over the course of a standard IT life cycle, whether that's mm -hmm. three years, five years, or people are stretching their gear longer and longer, right? That's the right way to do it for an IT professional, and so that's the way that NetApp wants to do it because that's what's right for our customers. Okay. So we touched on we touched on uh, PMEM earlier, uh, another high performance storage tier. So Jeff, can you tell us uh, how do they? You know, are they mutually exclusive and maybe with fabrics, or are they complementary? So I, they're absolutely complementary, and in fact. Um, you know, one of the things that graph that we showed a couple slides ago, one of, I think, the key takeaways for me on that was NVMe for SSDs is better than SAS for SSDs, but it's not this order of magnitude better, right? It's not this, um, it, it ties back to the forklift conversation. I think there's people who say, we have NVMe SSDs, so throw away all your SAS patch SSDs, and that's just, that's just silly, right? You've invested a lot of money in them. They're, you know, a little bit higher latency, but, but not order of magnitude. So when you get to persistent memory that you definitively need things like NVMe to use it and to leverage it. Um, I, I joke, you know, if anyone bothers to put persistent memory behind a SAS interface, right, that's kind of like engineering malfeasance, right? You should, that, that's <laughs> incredibly expensive, you know, that's like, quite frankly, it's like taking a Ferrari out on the highways here. It's like, you're all going five miles per hour, why does it matter, right? So if you're gonna go for this right now, what is a pretty expensive sports car, right? You gotta make sure you're on an open freeway and that's what NVMe is all about, right? Massive. Q sizes, massive Q depth, right? The ability to just really use all that capability that you purchased at a premium. And so NVMe, not just do they go together, I'd say NVMe is gonna be an absolute requirement Absolutely. to heavily leverage persistent memory. Okay, and now this next slide is a use case. So Jeff, tell us about a little bit about this slide. Yeah, this was the, uh, I think the use case that John was alluding to earlier. And I bet he wishes he had the numbers in front of him when he was trying to remember them from memory. Um, but this was my this memory was, was persistent. Yeah, it's actually got it pretty much right. Um, you know, and, and there were a couple of different examples here, right? So this was literally um, taking, and I think it's important. Sometimes, you know, uh, vendors, and I'll just say the industry in general plays games with benchmarks, right, and changes multiple variables at the same time. This is literally same exact storage system, right? So a NetApp AFF system, same exact switch, same server, same application same operating system levels on all of the above, same exact physical network, right? So nothing hardware changed, nothing changed about the OSs, but by moving from fiber channel to NVMe over fiber channel, exact same wire, exact same transport, getting a 50% increase in your peak IOPS and 80 microsecond reduction in your average latency, right? That literally is, I know it's not on a graph, but those are the curves, right? Mm -hmm. This is a non-disruptive software upgrade that we have already offered to our customers where literally a single LUN can get eight times the performance, a single port on the system can get three times the performance as a software upgrade, right? That's the cool part about NVMe, that's the cool part about NVMe of Fabrics, and if you don't mind us tooting our own horn for a second, that's the cool thing about doing it as a non-disruptive upgrade to existing infrastructure is unlocking that value for customers. Okay, so at this point, I just wanted to you know, call out to our audience and and ask if if there's any IT people out there um, that are willing to tell us where they're at in NVMe. Are they are you exploring it? Are you evaluating it? Have you actually deployed any uh, any any commentary on on you know your perception of this technology would be welcome. Yeah, please raise your hand if you if you're willing to be brave enough to talk about it. Okay, we're gonna just we're gonna continue to move on uh, to hot trend number three, which is uh, flash storage in hybrid clouds. And what I'd like to do is first ask John to just give us an overview of the hybrid cloud landscape, a simple definition of you know what does that mean, and why is it a hot trend? Well, I think you know there's a boy uh, the Gartner hype curve immediately springs to mind around the hybrid multi cloud conversations. 
Um, and I really think I would distill it down to the customer view of your cloud, your way. You put your data, your workload where it makes the most sense for you, whether that's a private cloud on-prem, whether that's you know an Amazon, Google, GCP, whether it's you know across multiple clouds, whatever makes sense for your business is the right answer. I know um, not you know, John, Jonesy's not with us, but I've heard him recently say often, "There's just one cloud," and I really think that's more of a data fabric story, and that's kind of what this picture to me represents from a NetApp perspective is the customer's ability with that app to place your data where it makes the most sense and you derive the most value. That's a very simple statement. It's not easy to do. This is a vision that's been being built for years. Um, there's a lot of it available. If you are interested in what's coming, that's a separate discussion. But hybrid cloud is no different than your data center. There are workloads that require the performance of flash. And so NetApp, you know, we've talked about a lot of on-prem either on the host with max data, um, NVMe over Fabric being available easily and, and simply with NetApp and the hint of directionality of other places it might appear in the product portfolio. But the cloud is no different. If your workload needs to be in the cloud, whether that's GPU as a service, whether that's just something that it makes sense for your business, being able to use persistent memory in the cloud is something that, that is absolutely, you know, has to be table stakes in this discussion. So, so I think what you're saying is that most, most IT organizations are now finding themselves with applications that are on-prem and in multiple clouds. Is that, is, is that another way of saying it? That is, <laughs> I, don't, I mean, the, the majority, maybe. The directionality, yes. The, the majority of people are, are absolutely doing that or planning to do that. And, and I think the other thing is people often think about, I'm going to spread my application across on-prem, multiple different clouds, and certainly there's, there's places where that makes sense, but increasingly it's, I'm going to place my applications where they make sense. And when we originally talked about the cloud, it was, oh, everything's going to the cloud. And then the realization that hybrid cloud, there was a role for on-prem, but they were treating the cloud as though it was singular. And increasingly, I think there's a recognition now that all clouds are not equal. And that doesn't mean that one is better than another. It means that they have different capabilities. It's Absolutely. like saying, I, I have one operating system and pretending that Windows and Linux are the same thing. They're not, right? Google Cloud, AWS, Azure, they all have strengths, they all have weaknesses. And yeah. especially in mid to larger enterprises and global enterprises, you're going to end up using all of the above in a lot of cases. Correct. So, and, and that's a good segue to this slide. So what, what this slide is attempting to illustrate is that, okay, now you've got flash infrastructure in different places on-prem and different clouds. You know, what does that mean to the IT department uh, in terms of their ability to manage it, tools, you know, what, requir what requirements emerge from that? John, can you give us a little commentary on that? I mean, I think, you know, this plays to the, as I said, the data fabric story for NetApp. It's, it's the ability to have a consistent, predictable way to manage, store, protect your data wherever it may live. Um, that could be on, on tap on-prem. That can be between Element OS and on tap. It can be um, on tap in the cloud. It could be cloud volume services. Whatever makes the most sense, again, there's, there's a lot of tools available when you're building something with NetApp and having that flexibility of not having to architect around the limitations of a particular aspect of the product family, but have multiple choices that make sense is something that's different. From a storage perspective, NetApp is able to enhance and optimize the native cloud experience through the cloud volume services offering. If your workflows are very ONTAP centric, then cloud volumes ONTAP in the cloud is a very seamless way to move data between on-prem and the cloud. And if you're like some of my customers where ONTAP is for some use cases, Element OS for others, and the ability to replicate between those platforms, uh, again, it's flexibility, it's future-proofing, it's the things that matter to a decision maker in IT and being able to not get locked into a particular silo that, that's hard to get out of. Because if you're like me, I can't predict what, what a year from now looks like, but if I make the right choices, it makes it easier. And, when, and I would add as a, as a neutral observer that only a few years ago, um, there wasn't a lot of choices to weave together your hybrid cloud, but you know, vendors, uh, leaders like NetApp, they now have public cloud offerings, on-prem offerings, and tools to manage it all, which is now uh, you know, part of the reason why this discussion even exists. That, that's a whole other webinar. 
Yeah, and and in fact, I'll, I'll do a cheap plug. If you want to go out and look at the keynotes from Insight 2018, which is our session, um, Anthony Lai, who runs our cloud business here, and others, mm -hmm. gave just a tremendous demo of thinking about the cloud and thinking about all of these places as just places you can run your application that you should be able to transparently orche mm -hmm. orchestrate, um, you know, application deployment and and with the net Kubernetes service being able to deploy Kubernetes containers on-prem, off-prem, and have it all act the same. And storage field day that was done during um, that insight is also very good in terms of uh, a deeper dive into that. Yeah. And uh, I will say, Frank, just wrapping up real quick on this slide, the one thing that is interesting is those thunderbolts in the cloud, um, <laughs> taking the metaphor farther. I mean, if we, if we take those to represent Flash, I think one of the misperceptions of the cloud very early on was cloud was like the slow thing, right? It was, it was, because people looked at the price of an S3 bucket or a blob and they said, wow, look at this deep storage. And it can do that, right? And we have ways of tiering to the cloud, things like Fabric Pool to let you use that, right? But, you know, just because something's in the cloud doesn't mean it can't be incredibly fast and need lower latency. And in a lot of cases, what we're finding is the cloud is a great place for people to turn to try out this new storage media without having to buy it and put it in their own data center, right? So, um, you know, even on the compute side, right, being able to buy GPUs in the cloud and deploy them, huge advantage. Okay. So if we got all this infrastructure, if we got apps and infrastructure in different all over the, the cloud and on-prem, you know, we need a data fabric. So Jeff, tell us about tell us about what you guys have for that. Absolutely. So, you know, it, it's it's as John said, it's almost a whole separate webinar, right? In fact, I'm pretty sure it has been. Um, but you know, the data fabric is both a vision and increasingly becoming productized through uh, cloud.netapp.com. Anything we talk about here, you can access directly at cloud.netapp.com. The data fabric is our way of treating the edge, treating core, treating cloud as they are, as resources that you can deploy to. I think in this sort of slide, we're showing it really as a data pipeline. And increasingly, we know that data is being generated out on the edge, right? We're seeing a ton. Here where I am in, in Silicon Valley, right? You look to your left, you look to your right, there's an autonomous vehicle. You can tell because those are the ones that are driving safely. Um, you know, but they're generating just tremendous amounts of data out on the edge. Um, IoT from sensors, from drones, from retail. That's where the data is coming. The ability to have a common architecture lets you ingest that into a core, and that core could actually be in the cloud, right? It, it's hard to represent this on a diagram, but put this in a core that lets you do things like artificial intelligence, um, lets you use things like ONTAP AI, mm -hmm. um, our leading AI platform that we've done in concert with NVIDIA, to do your data prep, do your training, deploy and reproduce, and then also tie in with, through things like cloud volumes, which John mentioned, with all of the major clouds out there. And NetApp being the leading data management provider and having been, uh, whether lucky or smart enough to not bother to try and stand up our own cloud, we work with all the clouds out there, right? Um, so rather than being the number 17 cloud, we're what powers the data management of all the top clouds in the world, right? So being able to work with things like Azure, with NetApp Files, a first, uh, sort of a first party service on Azure, working with AWS, with things like Cloud Volumes, Google Cloud, working with service providers like Equinix. We can help tie together all of your challenges across multiple different clouds and let you leverage that from edge to core to cloud um, with today's media and in the future with things like persistent memory. All right. So at this point, I mean, that, that concludes the presentation part of this. I'd like to move to the Q&A. I want a reminder of the, to the attendees that there's a $20 Amazon card for anybody that's brave enough to raise their hand and, and share with us any questions or comments. Um, and uh, I just want to wrap up by saying, uh, just when you thought you had your arms around your all flash array technology and how to use them, um, what you just heard is really three new, all new ways to leverage flash technology in the cloud with persistent memory uh, and with fabrics. And uh, it's, it's, there's, a, there's efficiencies to be gained for application performance to be gained, cost savings to be gained. I highly encourage you to, to talk to, to NetApp about how you, how you can leverage that. Okay, we don't have any uh, questions here, so I'm just gonna move to our last slide, which is on resources. And uh, if you would like to learn more, uh, first of all, if you'd like to talk to a human being, you can email me, frank.berry at itbrandpulse.com. Otherwise, you can see you can take an IQ test to find out uh, if you need to learn more. Uh, we, we have an IQ test that maps to this webcast content. Uh, you can also watch a video, listen to a, a podcast. You can learn more about persistent memory at, at the NetApp Information Center. And lastly, if you want to dig deep, there's a white paper on the NVMe over fabric. Uh, at Fiber Channel. Uh, so everybody, thank you for attending. And uh, this 
webcast will be available later on demand. Thank you, everybody. Signing Thank off. You. Thank you.